um, we were talking a bit earlier about the kind of um, bias towards male writers getting their work um, performed. Um, could you kind of say a little bit about why you think that might be? Well, I mean, there are so many different reasons why that happens. I mean, oppression doesn't exist as some kind of like binary, I am this, therefore I oppress you. It's infinitely more complicated, and we know this now. Like, there have been enough years of sociology as a discipline for us to understand how power and oppression works. And the reality is that it doesn't matter how many female television presenters there are, we live in a, a deeply sexist society. We have inherited 40,000 years of patriarchal traditions and literature. And I was giving a talk recently on Wide Suck like SEC and you know the relationship with Jane Eyre and talking about that it's, it's not until like these last few blinks of the eye mm. that we've had women represented in literature who weren't defined by a marriage quest, mm. that we had women who owned their own subjectivity. You know, there's a fantastic uh, essay, well, there's a whole book actually by Angela Carter called The Society in Women, mm. where she makes the case that um, Sard shouldn't be hated by feminists because for the first time you had women in literature who weren't defined by their capacity to breed. I mean, yes, they were getting raped and abused, but at least it wasn't just about bourgeois reproduction. And it's when we put, you know, that historical antecedent into perspective that, you know, it's almost overwhelming and almost silencing just to comprehend the responsibility on all women trying to just represent ourselves of like what has to be done in order, you know, for our subjectivity to be claimed. And in terms of my experience as a playwright, I have found it really difficult because I'm a working class woman and I changed my name deliberately because Vanessa Batum got no traction. Van Batum did, got a lovely letter from John Pilger to that young fellow, Van Batum, and, you know, and that happens to me a lot. Being a literary manager of a, of a new writing theatre, half, or in fact more than half, of the query letters I get attached to the scripts are for Mr Van, which I still find hilarious. Case in point, if you are submitting your script to a theatre, it is a good idea to Google the name of the literary manager before you send something. Um, but I, like, I mean, I have often quailed, and I'm quite a ballsy, bolshy, you know, a stridently feminist woman, but I have quailed at, oh, am I good enough? Should I really be putting myself forward? If my name is attached to the script and it's no good, are they going to remember me forever? Who am I to say these things anyway? You know, and being extraordinarily sensitive to criticism, more sensitive than, you know, a lot of male pirates. And I'm not saying that all women are sensitive and men aren't, but certainly women are socialised for other people to like them. Like, our whole trajectory is about, I have to make you like me because if you like me, I've got a better chance of having a partner to breed with. You know, and I, I don't want to be part of that cultural paradigm, but I am, and have to query that and challenge that every day. But certainly, overwhelmingly, there's you know a, a socialised lack of entitlement that goes with women artists and the right to make art, and that also intersects with class, and that also intersects with sexuality, and that also intersects with ethnicity. Like overwhelmingly, and you know why don't we have a, a population representative model of submissions that come into the theatre. I mean, at the Finber we're very lucky because our, without having diversity quotas to meet, we tend to meet those quotas because we're very overt about being a political theatre and that we want to create theatre that challenges ideological assumptions about the world and challenges oppressions as exist. Oh, somebody said something hilarious yesterday. We, we, I had a literary meeting yesterday and we were considering a play and um, it was about... Uh, it was about somebody suffering from somebody suffering from the in, internal demons of mental illness, and it was like, well, you know, this is quite, you know, it's an interesting piece of work, and there are strengths to it. And I was like, but is it a Finbra play? <laughs> and somebody on the literary team went, unless the main character's been raped by a genocidal maniac, no. And I was like, well, yeah, that's really what we do. It's like, and how do you tell a writer this would be great if it had a genocidal maniac? But I'm sorry. Like, there are not enough, you know, oppressed, you know, paradigmatic relations in this in this text. And certainly that's what we're looking for at the Finbra, and people know that. And, you know, and people from urban communities or regional communities or industrial communities and these extraordinary playwrights that we do find and champion, James Graham, Faith Miller, Jane Wainwright, you know, like, one of the reasons they come to us is because they find us on the website and they think that we sound pretty cool and groovy and they're passionate about talking about society. But it really, like, it, it's so frustrating because so many little decisions get made and, and I've noticed this not only in this job but in the previous job that I had 
um, when I was working at the office Royal in Sydney and certainly when I was working at a festival director and just small decisions that get made about women and women's writing as a genre and and their structural decisions that are internalized by women like I've I've been talking a lot about what's happened in Australia recently and the fact that women have organised, women have organised, there is a group called AWOL, Australian Women Online, and we're campaigning for quotas. Because in Australia, we've worked out that less than 13% of what's programmed in a main stage season, and these are state-funded companies in Australia, is writing by living Australian women. I mean, and that's absolutely obscene, that's outrageous. You know, and at one point, I read a set of figures that had um, compared a, a number of state-funded Australian theatres and looking at, uh, revi- like, if you counted all of the revivals into the seasons, as well as rediscoveries and new writing and promenade work and whatever, the representation of Australian living Australian women was 3%. I mean, and why are these structural inequalities happening? And of course, in Australia, and you know, I've heard the same thing here, you know, oh, we just don't get the writing, we just don't get the quality, we just don't get the work. And it's like, what kind of horse shit is that? Like, are you looking for these people? Are you bringing them into the theatre? Where is the radar on your head that's seeking out interesting and unusual moving truths about the world? Like, that is your responsibility as a theatre company to find the voice that's going to articulate the experiences of at least half of your audience and of course reading figures on this issue the audience of theatre goers in Australia is more women than men the audi- the, and on Broadway as well in the United States of America you know there are more women who attend the theatre than men and yet we've still got these ridiculous uh, like unbalanced models where more men get produced than women do and I mean this is what I've been saying and I've been screaming it like if this was happening in another state funded industry there would be an inquiry like you know if Australians or British scientific organisations or academic institutions if you had you know like a publicly funded university in Britain that was only employing 3% of its staff as women like they're people would be on strike, like there would be massive amounts of social and political action around that issue, but somehow when it comes to playwriting, like, and it's part of this philosophy, this just outdated, romantic, individualistic crap about how artists are chosen or special or or don't seem to, you know, like, and the genius just visits their individual playwright as they scribe in their room, and they're the people who, you know, come to with almost Byronic intensity, front up with their scripts of genius to the theatre company and and you know, and because it's just so miraculous, we don't have to check diversity and we don't have to look at quotas and we don't have to maximise participation. It just does my head in because it's such a male paradigm. It's such an absolutely male construction of that kind of you know, and I notice it particularly when I go to various playwright forums and hear male playwrights spout off about literary managers and dramaturgs and who needs a literary manager anyway. And in London there's been this real movement to axe literary managers and it's from men and it's men who want to work with other men who are directors and men with other men doing manly things. Because overwhelmingly you get literary managers who are women because that's the job you're allowed to have because it's like soft and delicate and it's not, you know, calls you directing, you know, it's literary managing and girls like books just like they like sewing, you know, kind of thing. And how dare these like young incredibly intelligent overeducated women tell you know like a 40 or 50 year old male playwright what's wrong with your script like what would they know kind of thing it's like love if you don't want my help fucking curse on your head if you seriously don't want me to be the boring police i condemn you to the dustbin of terminal boring nurse goodbye so um could you say a little bit about what the finger are looking for from, uh, well, from spec scripts, what the film are looking for is, uh, you know, what the artistic director says. And you know, let's be fair, the artistic theatre, the artistic director of my theatre is a man, but he's fantastic. And one of the reasons why he's a great artistic director is he doesn't direct, which is great. He's very, very good at team building. And certainly, um, I think one of the reasons why Neil employed me is because Neil wanted to have female representation in the staff of theatre, and he's very adamant about including women and identifying talented young women who are coming through who deserve opportunities and people from you know interesting and diverse 
backgrounds who have something to say and an unusual and unique way of saying it. And this is when people say to me, what do you want at the theatre? I'm like, we want unique. You know, we want different. We want you and new and we don't want the symptoms of your class experience. We don't want the symptoms of your gendered experience. We want an unusual and individual like an individual perspective on the world and its inequalities. Neil's motto is plays that matter on subjects that matter regardless of fashion. So unlike, you know, other theatrical communities where, oh, we're doing deprived South London youth this year, we don't do that. You know, and what we like are plays that are challenging not only in terms of their content and their subject matter, but also in terms of their form. And I mean, the playwrights that we really champion are the likes of Anders Lustgarten and James Graham. I mean, when they started writing for, and Becca Brunstetter, who's one of the women playwrights we have on a touch at the moment, Colleen Murphy, who's an um, extraordinary Canadian playwright, we're about to do three of her plays. They're playwrights who push form and they do exciting and very theatrical things with characterisation and structure and story. And yet at the same time, they're saying interesting things about the world that we live in. I mean, James Graham's last play for us, The Man, was about um, doing a tax return and became this, you know, like indictment on how commodification and monetization like restricts, restricts and shrivels the human imagination and, you know, the individual mind. Whereas Becca Brunstetter writes a lot about, um, she writes a lot about the implicit violence within heterosexual relationships and the dangers of anger and frustration when, you know, when the the patriarchal, the, you know, the patriarchal sort of trajectory of feminist, uh, sorry, of female realisation, which is bourgeois marriage and children, when that conflicts with, you know, the instinctive drives of women trying to self-realise, like, and how that spills over into violence and how that, you know, corrupts identity. I mean, it's exciting stuff and it's written in a really exciting way. And they're the kind of playwrights who, when they came to us, I mean, their work was a disaster. <laughs> James Graham submitted a 300-page script, and Neil was like, "What is this?" But there are bits of, there are moments of brilliance, but this kid's got to learn how to write a play. And certainly, that's one of the things we're looking for. We have other things that come to us perfectly formed and great if we think they're ready when they go. But we also use a lot of structures within the theatre to try and encourage and educate in stagecraft those sort of unique perspectives and that's what we really love and they're the plays that our audience like and really fly and that's not to say oh we're like so high core and we're so political and we're so radical and everybody else sucks that's just our brand and that's what we do we don't do plays about relationships we don't do plays about pedophiles we really don't do plays about pedophiles we don't like pedophile plays we really don't apparently a couple of years ago every second script we got was a you know, Neil reckons that you could find it on like page 80. It was, and I was raped by my dad. It was like, when that becomes boring, when incest becomes boring, we've got a cultural problem, you know. Um, but we also don't do plays about, about the, like, the inner life. We're not interested in looking into the mind of a character. We're interested in seeing how characters are looking into the minds of all of us. And that perspective is what I think makes our programming really dynamic.